Hello and welcome to our webinar. We're so glad to have you here with us today. We are going to get started on time and we will end on time to respect all of your busy lives as well. We're excited today to share with you the this project that we have just begun working on. And um, our host today is going to be our project leader, Dr. Hikaru Peterson from the University of Minnesota. So I'm going to pass it over to Hikaru. And in the meantime, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box or the chat box, and we will do our best to answer those as we go or save them for the end. Thanks, Cheryl. Th thank you, everybody, for joining um, us today. Um, just to kind of uh, set the stage for what this uh, webinar series is about, uh, we are a project team that is working on a project titled uh, Lessons from COVID-19, Positioning Regional Food Supply Chains for Future Pandemic Natural Disasters and Human-Made Crises. And it is one of um, 17 projects that are funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, NIFA, AFRI, Rapid Response to COVID-19 Program. Uh, it is a 24-month uh, period uh, project that started in last fall. And um, we are really looking forward to uh, finding uh, how COVID-19 has impacted our food supply chains, but also how creatively we can, um, uh, uh, you know, how, how creatively we can position ourselves in order to uh, be more adaptive for future uh, crises. And so we have uh, planned this four-part webinar series throughout our project period. And um, yes, webinar is one of those formats that are one-way communications. We, we do want to provide um, as many information as possible as we uh, discover uh, what we're learning and, and sharing it with you. But we also want you to know that we are a team of mostly social scientists. And that means that our findings quality really depends on what we hear from everybody else. So we really, this is an invitation for you to become a valuable contributor to our project as well. And so in that spirit, um, what we're planning for our first webinar for today of the four part series is to introduce um, the project to you so that you're familiar with it, uh, what parts of the projects you might be able to contribute to, uh, and then focus uh, primarily on our first large activity, which is a supply chain survey. Um, and then we do have some preliminary findings that we're able to share today um, from uh, the, the surveys that we've conducted in Florida earlier last year, um, and then also some insights from the consumer behavior survey. Uh, we also would like to share some of the um, uh, online resources that, that might be readily available um, and, and you are interested in uh, using, as well as introducing expected outreach deliverables from this project. And then we'll wrap it up with some questions and answers. And I I think Cheryl has invited you already to add to the um, question and answer um, chat if you have any if you have any questions to us as we go along. So here is the project um, overview. Um, the way we're seeing it, we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted our supply chains. As we know, our food system, um, the core function of it is to providing food, safe and appropriate food to people, um, but also supporting the livelihoods. And this disruption has really um, uh, compromised those core functions. And so this is a research and outreach integrated project. What we're trying to do is to generate knowledge and resources to enhance preparedness of the U.S. agri-food supply chains for future disruption options. And in particular, we're focusing on exploring the extent to which uh, regional or shorter uh, food supply chains can effectively augment the mainstream supply chains so that we can, um, uh, when, when we are faced with future crises, that there are, we will not see similar disruptions that we've witnessed in, in 2020. Um, and, and our focus here is ensuring the economic security of our small scale operations. There are uh, four project objectives. Uh, one is to uh, really look at the impact of COVID-19 pandemic um, throughout our food supply chain operations, starting from the farm um, all the way to the, the food service. And then also um, look at how the consumer's behavior are changing and how they're planning to uh, evolve um, post pandemic. If we ever get there, we do feel like we have, we're seeing perhaps the end of the light, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, we're we're also interested in uh, critically assessing the capacities and structural vulnerabilities of regional or shorter uh, food systems to support their population needs. 
And then um, the other objectives are more uh, outreach focused. We'd like to develop resources and strategies for current and future disruptions, as well as develop and offer training programs to strengthen support and understanding for local and regional supply chain participants at the time of the disruptions. So with that, um, you know, the strength of our project really is our team. And we are a, um, uh, we are we're representing uh, five different academic institutions, but we're spread across the nation, uh, literally from coast to coast. And and so um, we'd like to I'd like to introduce uh, my team members by the regions that um, are represented are represented. So first from the North Central region, uh, uh, from Minnesota, uh, myself and uh, and Gigi Giacomo is is uh, participating. Um, and then from Kansas State, uh, you've already been hearing or meeting <laughs> Cheryl. Um, and uh, Cheryl is primarily uh, going to be our extension lead for the, for the project. And then from uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison, we have uh, Michelle Miller and um, Andrew Stevens, who are looking primarily into the food flow analysis, uh, but also um, economic structure of the food supply chains. And then um, Lindsay, who is with the UW uh, Extension System, um, her specialties in community food systems, and, and she will be um, uh, supporting in, 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 in co-leading with Cheryl on Extension efforts. From the southeast region, uh, they're all based in, in Florida. And so uh, Lori is, is our communication expert. She'll be uh, telling us, sharing us later about the consumer insights and, and also um, also the online resources that, that we're trying to compile. Uh, Krista is our expert in um, disaster response surveys. I don't know if that's a claim you want to have, uh, Krista, but um, we, we've been really fortunate to have her on the team and the reason why we've been able to um, rapidly develop a, a COVID impact survey is very much uh, thanks to Krista's um, uh, found, foundational work. Um, and then Angie is our uh, another extension communication ex extension expert um, in, in how we communicate to and reach out to stakeholders in a time of disruption. Um, and then Anissa is our wonderful um, project staff who helps um, make everything beautiful, uh, including our PowerPoint slides today. Uh, from the Southwest, um, the, the two fabulous colleagues are from uh, University of California, Irvine. Um, Gustavo and Lee uh, bring a lot of um, interdisciplinary uh, expertise in agroecology, geography, and, and also from the global perspective as well. And so they are um, uh, integral part of uh, developing our survey instruments, as well as finding out more through one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews and, and focus groups later in the project. We're also blessed to have a national team of advisory board members. Um, these are the um, current individuals, a really impressive uh, list of folks that, that we're really grateful for their um, willingness to, to help us shepherd this project along so that we can get as much as we can you know, through our discovery and, and sharing process. Uh, we have great representation from academic academia uh, across uh, different uh, disciplines and institutions, but also we really wanted to have representation across the entire uh, food supply chain, and we're really grateful for their, um, their expertise. So just a snapshot of um, different things we're planning to do as part of this 24-month uh, project and we really are packing in a lot. <laughs> and so these, each of these uh, bullets really represents the research and outreach uh, activities that we're planning to do. We have a um, COVID-19 impact survey that, that we'd like to discuss in full because it's really ready. It's on the cusp of being launched. We're just waiting for the final approval from, from our institutions to, to go ahead and, and launch the survey. But we, this is where we really would like to reach out to all the supply chain members to tell us about how the pandemic has impacted um, their operations as well as their creative solutions. We're also planning on a consumer survey, uh, which is national in scope. And then we have um, a quite a bit of, of analytical work ahead of us uh, using different um, uh, modeling pr procedures and analytical procedures. Um, and then we're also uh, turning to um, 
uh, brainstorm solutions with folks through focus groups and interviews, and, and as well as making sure that we communicate our discoveries through communication platform, online resources, and the professional development training. So the ones that um, I kind of highlighted in squares are uh, primarily the areas that, that, that we really would like to partner with you uh, in order to make sure that we're not missing anything uh, uh, important out and we can um, uh, turn our discoveries into as relevant as we can. Um, partly, you know, to make the project feasible, many of the research activities are limited to our study regions in the upper Midwest, um, Florida, and, and also South California. But um, the consumer survey and outreach activities are national in scope, and our research findings should serve as benchmarks for other parts of the nation as well. And so now I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues, um, Gustavo Lee and Michelle, to um, tell us a little bit more about the supply chain survey, which is the first activity, first main activity that we'd like you to become acquainted with. Thank you, Hikaru. Uh, we're very excited today to share with you a little bit about our awesome survey. Um, just like a supply chain is beautifully complex, so our, is our survey. And it has many moving parts, but uh, chances are you may only see part of them when you take the survey. So we've got uh, questions for farm and supply chain businesses throughout our study regions. Um, as you know, they grow different things in Florida, California, and Wisconsin, Minnesota. And our survey will help um, tease some of that out. Uh, we're interested in knowing how farming business, farming and food businesses have been affected by the pandemic, um, how they've been affected by public health measures and the economic crisis that has ensued. Uh, we are particularly interested in learning more about the innovations that uh, so, um, food businesses have made to make our, our supply chains more resilient. And we're hoping that um, uh, uh, we can learn a lot about um, how to strengthen our, su our supply chains across regions. We'll be looking at differences and impacts across sectors and commodities, across regions and business scale and scope. Hey folks, and this is a sample of what the structure of the survey looks like. You know, we put a collective effort to really make a very robust instrument it begins with a short introduction and then asks if the business is open, if the business closed temporarily in 2020 and then reopened, and if the business closed down completely. So notice that we also, we also want to get the survey into the hands of people who worked in the food systems, but whose business had to shut down in the past year. And we want to understand why, when, how, and so forth. After understanding these questions about you know, temporary closures and such, Everyone then will get a set of questions particular to their business operation, whether it's in production, you know, farming, processing, wholesaling, retailing, or food service. There's going to be a specific set of questions there. No, you don't have to get all of them. If you identify, oh, my business is just in retail, you're only going to get the questions about retailing. On the other hand, if you are a farmer that does some on-farm processing, you'll be able to also get questions about your production acreage, crops, for example, and also the processing activities that you undertake. Um, after these uh, like sector-specific questions, everyone is going to then get a set of questions about business innovation. What were the kind of partnerships that emerged for you that helped your business you know, make it through this difficult year? What were some of the new technologies or techniques that helped your business you know, try to, to gain some ground or find new markets or new suppliers when, you know, everything was being upended. Afterwards, there's a set of questions about the characteristics of the operator, some basic demographic information, you know, like age and so forth and so on, so we can have a sense of, you know, who the folks are. And also, this is important for us to understand the kind of access to policy uh, mechanisms, access to resources and, you know, if someone's falling through the cracks or not, uh, and why. The whole survey, we, we estimate, would take between 20 and 30 minutes to complete, depending on how complex your business is. A CSA farm that does production and retailing might take a little bit longer than a processing uh, company, 
a processing company that's huge with many different you know facilities might have more uh, to answer than other but in general uh, it should take about 20 to 30 minutes there are some questions that are quite detailed about cash flow about income quarterly you know which quarter did your income rise or fall um, so it's helpful for the person to be very familiar with your business and maybe have access to their books but if at some moment you or someone who you pass the survey to you know gets kind of overwhelmed with the details we would rather the person skip a question and complete the survey than just give up you know so please you know try to to make it through the survey encourage folks to to make it all the way through on the next slide you'll see a sample of what the survey looks like here's a sample question you know this one is asking about um, employment Notice that we also ask about 2019, so we can have a baseline of how things change in 2020. Notice that you can take the survey just as well also on mobile devices, on your phone or, or tablets or so forth and so on. Now I'll pass to my colleague, Dr. Lee Jung. So this survey is based on the work of Dr. Krista Court and her colleagues at University of Florida who served the survey, the impact of hurricane and climate change on Florida's uh, agriculture. Between September and November of last year, we adapted that survey with a design focused on the impact of the pandemic across our three study regions, expanding the whole survey to uh, cover the whole food supply chain, as Gustavo mentioned in his uh, previous um, introduction. So then in December, we tested the survey and launched the, the survey, uh, launched the survey this month. So we're going to collect responses uh, until the end of uh, uh, February. So we really, really need uh, your help and your, uh, your collaboration uh, to spread a word and then do the survey uh, at this really uh, timing moment. So now I pass to uh, Krista to tell you more about some of the results of their previous uh, surveys. Thanks, Lee. So first I'll tell you a little bit about sample outputs from past work uh, and get into results at the very end of it. So um, as the others have mentioned, when COVID-19 hit, we have a disaster impact analysis program here at the University of Florida within the um, Food and Resource Economics Department. And one thing that we typically do is analyze losses in the agricultural sector after a natural disaster event, like a tropical cyclone or a freeze. And we were able to pivot um, the tools that we use for those types of events to analyze COVID-19. Um, this is back in February and March when things were first shutting down in the United States. Um, I worked with colleagues in the Food and Resource Economics Department, uh, Dr. Andrew Ropicki and John Lai, and we pivoted to analyze both agricultural operations as well as marine industries in Florida. Um, so I'll, I'll show you a little bit more uh, results from that particular survey, but the type of information that's coming out of this is, was really important to uh, decision-making that was going on at all local, state, and the federal level. Um, as we as these entities tried to make some decisions um, uh, and provide relief uh, that needed to get these industries through these hard times. So some of the other sample outputs from the past work here, we have uh, also work from the Pi Center and um, that we've incorporated some tools that they have used to analyze COVID-19 into this survey. And um, I'll, I'll speak about this a little bit more on the next few slides, but as the others have mentioned, we have to collect this information from you all in order to be able to do this. So in some cases uh, here in the state of Florida, we produce 200 to 300 different commodities. And you know, if, if I get a thousand survey responses, that might be just a few from each of those commodities. So only in the case where we have these high response rates and people are willing to share their experiences with us, can we produce something like um, a commodity specific report that we were able to produce for shellfish aquaculture um, from this sur first survey effort. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so some findings that we uh, got from the quarter one and quarter two, the type of information that can come out of the survey. One of the things that people are always asking for is uh, what was that number? What was that change in sales revenue uh, experienced by these different types of disaster events? So uh, we were able to uh, put, this graph is showing us both the range 
of answers between or from different commodity groups for those changes in sales revenue for a March to mid-May period. And also you'll see these bars in the middle that are representing the average. Um, so you can see that some operations were doing very, very poorly and lost all of their revenue in this period. And some were actually doing better and had increases in revenue as people were moving to these alternate supply chains um, or adapting in other ways to respond to the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So we were able to take that type of information along with some uh, baseline data that we collect on just you know, an average over the last five years of sales revenues across these commodities. What percentage of total annual revenue do these uh, commodity groups normally bring in in that March to mid-May period? Um, as you might expect, some uh, agricultural operations are in harvest at different times and they're expecting to have revenue not steadily through the entire um, calendar year, but it will increase and decrease as we move along. So uh, also we could then calculate output at risk. Can we go back to that other slide? Um, output at risk in that time period, that percentage loss that we just looked at from the survey that varies um, across the different commodity groups to analyze, you know, to finally estimate what was that total revenue loss. And it was nearly 900 million dollars in Florida just in that March to mid-May period that we can attribute directly to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, again, we're looking at commodity groups here because we had several um, responses across different commodities within these commodity groups that we could analyze. When a particular commodity provides enough information, then we can get down into those um, details, but that's only possible when we collect enough information. So we have had um, several requests after producing the shellfish aquaculture report, you know, can you tell us what happened to um, this particular commodity or that particular commodity? And often the answer has been uh, no, because we didn't get enough responses from the public. So I, I would just encourage you like others that if you are willing to share this information, um, it could really help in the decision making process because often at um, the policy making level, if they don't have information, especially if they don't have quantifiable information on these losses, then they're not as readily able to make decisions um, on things like relief packages. Next slide. Um, so just some final thoughts from survey respondents. One of the things that we did is build a word cloud out of um, just an open response that we give them at the end. You know, we, we ask a lot of questions, um, not too many questions, but we ask a lot of questions and then we feel like you know, we might not have covered everything. So there will be a chance to just share your thoughts or share any um, impacts or experiences that weren't covered in the specific survey. And you can see here from that initial survey that everybody, it was really about a demand side shift where they lost their typical market or they lost sales or a price changed. Um, and, and we're hoping to learn more about that because it's very different than the supply side shocks that we usually experience during a natural disaster. Um, and now I will pass to uh, Lori Baker. Oh. I am going to talk about our consumer survey that we have planned as a part of this project. So um, that survey will actually launch, if we can go to the next slide, in April 2021. So we clearly don't have data yet from that. However, um, we are working um, with the supply chain survey to ask some similar questions so that we can compare um, what the needs were during that time of consumers, along with um, what we were seeing as far as changes in the market. So we can build um, a scenario for how people have adopted or not adopted new practices during this time and how many of those we think they would return to in a future disruption and how many of them they're going to stick with even if um, there isn't a future disruption. So um, while that's in the process of being launched, um, we will ask about their adoption of these channels, food purchases, preferences, and needs. And what this project has really given us an opportunity to do is partner with a lot of other people who are collecting this data. So as we've mentioned briefly, almost every part of our project team was already collecting data on this topic. So we'll work within our team um, through our Center for Public Issues Education in Agriculture and Natural 
natural resources or Pi Center. Um, we'll also work with um, things that we have done with the Center for Rural Enterprise Engagement before, which is a part of this team. But we're also reaching out to other partners who have been conducting surveys during the same time frame, so that we can leverage this data and get it at different points in time. Um, if we um, are asking the same quite types of questions. So another one of those partners that we've met with recently is the local food economics group. Um, they've asked some questions also at a couple of different periods of time um, that we'll be able to compare with our consumer data to see if we can build a better model from a consumer perspective of what this might look like in the future. Um, on the next slide, I do have a little bit of data um, we have done through our Pi Center. Um, we started doing public opinion data collection in March um, of 2020. So we collected for the first time, and, and you'll see in this uh, chart here, March 13th through the 15th, we did a public opinion survey with um, approximately 1500 people. Um, and we sampled um, for US census categories so that it was pretty representative of the US population at that time. We also did a very similar survey with ag and natural resource leaders, um, March 16th to the 21st. And then that second public opinion survey there we did April 23rd to May 7th. And then that third one there um, was July 23rd to August 9th. Um, we have all sorts of data points that we're collecting over time, some related to general concerns related to COVID, and then some specifically related to food concerns and COVID. Um, we also have another data collection that just finished last week um, that we haven't analyzed yet. Um, but I put this in here so you'd be able to see a few of the things that we're collecting in this um, table here. We were asking about their concern related to increase, increased food prices. And these are reported on percentages um, because particularly the ag and natural resource leaders was a much smaller sample. So for them to, to be comparable in this format, but essentially what we see here is that over time, people have become more and more concerned about um, the increased cost of food during this time. Um, interesting, our ag and natural resource leaders weren't quite as concerned about increased food prices. We suspect that's because many of them know um, that we already pay a pretty low um, cost for food in this country. So um, small increases um, may not be as substantial, um, but people were certainly noticing this and were noticing that they weren't having products on their shelves during this time. Another data point that we collected in that third survey um, is on the next slide here. Um, one of the focuses of this project is kind of seeing how these alternative supply chains were working. And we ask a series of questions um, related to local foods and how they purchase those and some of those decisions. Um, we're still working with that data. It's a part of a master's student's thesis project, but um, I did pull just this number here to share today is that 72.2% um, of that 1500 or so that answered this survey said they had purchased food um, within that last month. And that was the eight, the range of late July to early August. So people were actively seeking um, alternative food supply chains during this time, um, going more to local farmers, trying to find um, those things out. What we really found as far as attributes related um, to local food is those aligned very closely with what people usually look for in local food, um, which is, you know, quality, um, price, um, freshness. Um, so we weren't seeing a lot of changes related to the things they were looking for, but we were seeing um, a shift in people's interest in purchasing local food during that time. And we'll continue in our data collection um, to measure some of these uh, to get a greater sense of how that's changed since the beginning of this pandemic um, up until um, when we launch in April, we'll have over a full year's worth of data that we'll be able to, um, to have these different brackets for. So a little bit more about 
what we are going to have to offer for you as far as online resources. Um, we've started building some of these products. The data that I talked about today um, is available at the Pi Center website. We have a specific landing page for COVID-19. Um, amazing staff have helped us create fact sheets and social media graphics and webinars um, and videos that are all available there for you to use and share as needed. Um, there's also uh, plenty of other information and links to other presentations we've done um, that you may find helpful as far as gathering national opinion data, um, either for yourself or to share with some of your audiences. Um, we also have created um, materials for our own project. Um, that we're building in the process right now. We're doing what we call an environmental scan. And so we are collecting, um, one of the major things that we saw um, in this pandemic is again, people were wanting local food, but they weren't sure where to find local food. And so there have been a lot of initiatives across the United States really working to connect people with their local farmer to find some of these alternative channels. So we really wanted to quantify that. Um, so we're doing an online scan currently um, to find different audience channels, to find specific communities that they're involved in, um, excuse me, and what types of reports are available. Um, do they have blogs? Do they have fact sheets? Do they have FAQs? Is it a uh, connect you with your local farmer kind of area? Some of these topics are adopting new technologies, best practices for delivering service in these new ways. Um, consumer messaging and promotion, human resources and worker safety, and food safety. Um, as a part of this process, we have, again, been able to network with a lot of different teams doing some of this work. And one of those is um, the USDA's Local Food Systems Response to COVID resource page. Um, and it looks like Cheryl is sharing these links along the way in the chat, so they are clickable. But if right in this moment, you're looking for some of these resources, they are um, available and searchable by partner type, by channel type, by resource type and audience type. Um, when we're done with our environmental scan, we've already been visiting with the people who developed this project so that any new information we find, we can include within this one hub also, as opposed to us creating an entirely new hub when one already exists for this. So that's a great resource for you to check out that has materials available now. We also have our own landing page for this website off of our Center for Rural Enterprise Engagement website, um, Lessons from COVID-19 here. Um, on this site, we also have our Touchless Transaction Series, which was done, um, <coughs> excuse me, by our Cree center so we have some resources available there this is also where we will be posting recordings of this webinar and we will be sharing um, other materials as they're developed for this project and those of you who registered for the webinar um, we will send you an email as soon as those are up and ready and available for you so you'll be tuned in to the next things we have coming Sorry, and now I will turn it over to Cheryl for our expected outreach deliverables for the project. All right, thank you, Laurie. Um, so you may have noticed that I'm the lone person uh, from Kansas State University, and that is because uh, the a group, a subgroup of those of us on the team have a center together, and I am an extension specialist. So my background is in ornamental and landscape horticulture, um, but I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Extension leader for Kansas State University. And so I coordinate with other states in the North Central region. And as you might expect, we have done quite a bit of online training in the last huh, less than a year. So um, just I know speaking for myself, we I just did my annual evaluation and I have uh, went from zero to 169 hours of recorded video content like this webinar that you're attending right now. 
um, just in 2020 after the pandemic hit. So we've gotten lots of experience with delivering education and training online, and we're translating that to the to help us communicate the lessons that we are learning from the, the results of the research in this project. So as Laurie was mentioning, we're, we're, we will have an, some online resources and you'll notice that many of these links are coming from all over the different states and the different components of our project. We live in a world where we all have different skills and abilities and different platforms that we have access to at our institutions. And that really benefits this project because we can collaborate together and um, really spread the work of what we're doing out uh, in, in the right ways. And so we're excited that we'll be able to share those resources with you and, and put them in, in one place and help you to go through it. I mean, we know that there are a lot of resources out there and we're trying to curate the content that makes the most sense for those of you who are involved in the food supply chain. Um, so we will um, be working with this website for curating resources. The part I'm really excited about is the training that we're going to be developing. So this comes sort of at the tail end of this two year rapid response project. So by the time you attend the fourth webinar in the series, we will have all sorts of details about how you can access both an asynchronous course on this topic and a, a, a synchronous, which is all together at one time like this, um, train the trainer conference. So we're, we will be building those pieces over uh, the next year and have something ready to talk about next spring. So uh, the other parts of, of what we're doing for outreach and education are the communication of the project deliverables. So we're really grateful that those of you have signed that who are attending have signed up to learn about our project and we'll have more and more data every time we have a webinar. And the good news about this is that we have set this webinar series up. So we've already picked the dates. You don't have to sign up again or be reminded. Uh, we will we will automatically send you rem reminders as those days come up in your calendar, and we will also be recording them, and we'll make sure that you have access to those afterwards and can uh, go back and, and review the progress. And if you can't make it that day, you'll be able to watch it later, of course. So we'll also be working on, on publicity news media releases. Uh, we have some extension publications and some journal articles already in the works. Um, and then we'll be it being doing interviews on podcasts. We probably won't have our own, but we will go be guests on podcasts that make sense for for communicating the knowledge in this project. So please, if you have a podcast suggestion for us that you think we would be great guests on, please feel free to share that with us and we will put that on the list and get it in the works. Um, and then, you know, as, as academics, we will certainly have conference presentations and move forward with academic journal articles. So there's lots to look forward to on this project, but I think to wrap it up, we need some help from you. So. I'm gonna pass it back to Hikaru to take us through the next pieces. Yes, so I hope, um, you know, this was, like I said, it's a, a very early in our 24 months uh, process of discovery. And so we only had, you know, a, a few uh, preliminary findings to share with you, but we're really looking forward to um, our next, um, next uh, webinar uh, in June, when we can really share uh, what, what we find from our COVID-19 impact survey, and we'll most certainly have some preliminary uh, findings from a consumer survey as well. But we really need your help, and, and you've been hearing this many, many times, but our findings are only as good as, as the, the participation that, that we're able to get. So please um, spread the word. I know there are a lot of a lot of COVID-19 related surveys that are circulating, but I hope we were able to convince um, to you that this is a, a fairly a, a rare surveys where when we're really collecting uh, quantitative data, when we really can put the numbers on the impact that the, the food supply chain is, is facing. And, and so I hope you um, uh, reach out to uh, help us spread the word and, and um, encourage uh, folks to, to sign up to receive uh, 
uh, invitation to participate. And in fact, there is a, um, a sign up uh, website uh, that is hosted by um, UC Irvine that when you go to that uh, web page, you're able to provide us with the information and, and you will receive uh, a survey link to, to complete. Um, it would also be wonderful if you uh, work with uh, members organizations, um, if you could help us distribute the, the survey link to your um, um, to your membership as well. And, and also, you know, we've been focusing so much on the survey because we really are within days of launching our, our survey um, and, and uh, whatnot. But but there are certainly other parts of the projects that, that we could help uh, use your help, like Cheryl mentioned, if you have um, podcast series or other opportunities to spread the word and, and um, invite folks to, um, to, sh to share our, our work, but also um, trying to really figure out you know, what, what the impact of COVID-19 is and how we can creatively um, prepare our food system for future disruptions, please contact Gigi. Um, I think she will be the most um, responsive of all of us. Um, she says she's the one who's helping us manage our, our project. And so it will be wonderful um, if you reach out to her with any of the ideas that you have. And in the meantime, um, right now uh, we have um, plenty of time to have some discussion. And like I said, you know, webinar as a format is usually a one-way conversation, but we really would like to have this a two-way um, opportunity. So I'm going to hand it back to um, Cheryl and Lori, who can facilitate our discussion session. Thanks, Hikaru. Uh, we are just zooming through our content. We thought we'd just we thought we'd be pushing right up to the very end with all the fun things we had to say. So we're uh, excited to have quite a bit of time for questions. So please um, use the chat box, use the Q&A box to help us um, get to the things you're wondering about. We've had quite a few, I say quite a few, we've had a handful of questions that have come through the chat box that we've been answering as they come along. Um, you know what, I'm just going to spotlight everybody. If you guys would all like to turn your cameras on, We'll we'll uh, we'll let everybody see you. So, Laurie, which question do you think we should go first? Have we answered um, the few that that have come through? Yes, I believe we've answered all of the ones that have come through in the chat. Oh, I see some popping up now, though. Um, I see. What was the consumer behavior survey sampling included different different demographic groups, geographic locations, income levels, and if so, are the data shareable? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. Um, the consumer behavior data we've collected prior to this has all been um, a part of either our Pi Center projects um, or some of Krista Court's projects. So um, we have sampled in those instances based on the U.S. Census. So um, based on um, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, um, as well as gender. And so um, those are not, the data are not shareable in that form, but we have the results shareable at the website, um, the landing page for the Pi Center, the COVID page that Cheryl shared in the chat earlier. Um, and we do have a few publications we're working on for those. Some of them when they move to journal, we will be able to um, share them through the journal site. Um, as they'll be available that way, but we're not sharing them publicly until we've reached the publication piece. Okay, um, we do have this question from Craig. To what degree are we investigating food safety management and concern by producers and consumers? So it's a food safety question. Oh, or, Lee and Gustavo. Or food sourcing question, is that what I'm reading? Oh, no, the food safety, I see. Um, Lee yeah. Gustavo put an answer. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, for, for food safety, because um, my previous doctoral work mainly about food safety, even though it's, uh, it's focused on, on Chinese food safety issues, but I think in this project, for sure, we're going to try to um, do some focus group and interviews about food safety uh, in our study region or even across the country, because 
due to the cold chain of COVID, you know, um, uh, items contamination that, you know, spread in the international consumers' concerns, you know, scope. So uh, what I'm, we are thinking that in a group, in a whole teamwork, I think um, for sure we're going to look at that issue, but also together with the informal food sectors that emerging during the, the pandemic and also the lessons that different innovation groups are facing. So yeah, definitely we're gonna try to do that in the first group and the interviews. Yes, and, and that's great. good point too, the, um, we have collected data through the Pi Center on food safety specific to um, USDA guidelines for handling fresh fruits and vegetables um, because we were hearing stories of people washing fruits and bleach and things that are not recommended. Um, so again, that piece is a part of a, a thesis that we haven't released all of that data yet, but we do have some of those data points and, and we'll likely cons uh, consider some of them for inclusion in our April study. All right, thank you. Um, while we're on the question of the survey, there is a question from Virginia wondering if she's in Washington state and she wants to know if we're interested in information gathered from businesses outside of our study regions. So I'll take that question. Um, I, yes, we can take it. What are, the way that we've set up the survey is that we'll, there are separate surveys coming out from the separate regions, but all of them can collect data from outside of their region. Um, so you will have an opportunity to say, you know, I'm not located in California, but I'm located in Washington State and where in Washington State and fill out the rest of the survey. Uh, one thing that I'll say is if we are not advertising as heavily in those areas, we might not get as many responses. So it might not be that in the end we are able to produce Washington state specific results if we didn't collect enough information. But if it is there, it's certainly something that we could do or we could roll those into some of our national level analyses. So I would say absolutely. Um, it just might be that you, if we don't have as many responses from those places, you don't see a geographic specific analysis of those results at the end. That's a great answer. Thank you, Krista. All right. Um, Let's see, which direction do you want to go, Lari? There's a question about the consumer behavior survey. Um, did you, are we going to ask respondents how their recent food sourcing compared with what they did a year ago? How are we assessing change over time? Yes, um, <laughs> the way that we've asked that, um, those questions started in our public opinion survey three, which was July 23rd to August 9th. Um, so we have them starting in that time frame, um, And we asked them um, prior to COVID, how you were sourcing your food through different channels um, in fairly large frames, um, as far as related to grocery store, local food, um, home delivery, um, food banks, those types of things. And then we asked during, and then we asked what they thought they would do post pandemic. Um, but working again with this local food economics group, they've asked those in some more specific buckets. And I believe the timeline of their survey was um, maybe it was starting in September uh, 2019, I think. So it was September 2019, April 2020, September 2020. And then our survey will be asking about April uh, 2021. So we, um, to by designing the, the questions that are comparable to the local food economics groups uh, survey, we're hoping that we can really see the um, uh, the, you know, it really is, it really just worked out beautifully on, on the same um, intervals uh, over this, um, uh, you know, year plus period over the pandemic. All right. Thank you. Okay, next question. To what degree are you investigating supply chain situations on U.S. island territories such as Guam and CNMI? Does anybody know? I don't think that they are included in um, the current survey. We did the 50 states plus Washington, D.C. at this point, um, but we have worked with colleagues in, uh, in the Caribbean, um, not necessarily looking at U.S. Ter territories, but looking at, uh, you know, how being 
a small open economy was different than um, being a in the food supply chain within the United States. So I know that others um, are looking at some of these that might be applicable, but I don't believe that they are included in um, the survey. That doesn't mean that they might not be included in interviews or focus groups as, um, as US residents there. Krista, are um, Alaska and Hawaii included? Yes, they are in there. So we at least get one island and um, you know, Alaska is a little different too. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, um, work with us if you want to oh, yeah, go more. ahead. Please. You know people who are doing that work and, and if you want, if you have that data, get in touch with us. It'd be yeah. fascinating to, to get comparable uh, work as, as that too. One, one other thing that I'll mention is that um, one of the one of our hopes is that we have some publications coming out that explain the tools that we're using so that if others are interested in using the same tools to analyze a different region, um, then they will be able to do that and have results that should be comparable with ours. So absolutely, if you are interested in um, you know running your own version of the survey as soon as those come out, then that will be possible. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we are a little bit back to Laurie on the next one. Um, to what degree are we looking at changes in dining practices, both from the perspective of consumers as well as professional chefs? Um, so in the data we collected in that um, public opinion three time range, we did ask about um, dining at restaurants and takeout. Um, nothing about professional chefs. Um, I, I don't think that's really been on our radar, um, but we did ask about those dining practices, both prior to pandemic, during the pandemic and after the pandemic. Um, I did run some of that data this morning um, and there were some significant changes from pre um, pandemic to during pandemic. I didn't run the post pandemic. Um, again, we have a lot of data that we're still trying to work through and see what fits in where. Um, but from that large scale piece, we have asked some of those questions, but nothing about um, personal professional chefs necessarily. Okay, thank you. And the, the next question is, is somewhat similar, Laurie, in that the, the question is whether we're going to be able to measure the increase in consumption in retail purchased food uh, as more people stayed home and cooked more at home. And are there any si insights for that trend to continue after COVID? I, I do think that's something we're measuring, yes? Yes, that is absolutely something that, that we're measuring. And again, it's another data point that, that we're working with other groups that have collected data at different periods of time. Um, so we should have some pretty solid um, data points on retail food purchases and, and where those might fit into people's plans post pandemic or during a future crisis. And Cheryl, I will also add that on the supply chain um, survey for the food service uh, sector, that we do have questions about um, the, the changes in sales by whether it was a um, carry out or dining um, portion of their revenue. And of course, you know, I, I know that many of the folks in the food service industry, wherever you are, is dealing with like almost weekly changes in, in the regulations that are coming from the state. So we really don't know how, you know, uh, we, we almost feel bad asking them to, to complete a survey in, in the time when they're really trying to, to manage their operations. But at the same time, like we really would like to, like, we would really like to take their voices and be made it heard on what sort of um, impact that these, you know, up and down uh, regulations are, are having on the, on these operations. So we're hoping that um, we can, um, we can catch those food service uh, folks in, in completing our survey as well to get a little bit more insight on that. That's kind of one of the questions we, we have in the in the box is how are we capturing the impact of all of those regulations and controls so that that is something that you know we need your help to help answer. Uh, get our survey answered so we can try to capture that data and it is a lot but we're grateful for it and everyone will be. Okay, we have time for just a few more questions. Um, the next one is similar to some other ones do we have contacts and plans to distribute the survey and get data from, I'm 
New York, New York State. I'm assuming that's what NYS is. And I think that's probably similar to what Krista said earlier in terms of, you know, yes, we will accept it. It's not one of our major areas that we're aiming for, our, our major regions. But if we get enough data from there, we can do something with it. So we sure encourage you to spread the word on the survey. Anything else you guys want to add to that? Okay. Um, Okay, this one is one for the uh, the ag economics folks. Um, how is the survey allocating its weighting factors in terms of business status, open, closed, semi-open versus size and diversity of businesses? It sounds complicated. <laughs> I was. I, I think I, we were looking at each other like, who's going to take that that answer? Um, so. Um, one of the things that, that we are um, really trying to do is we, you know, in order for us to get as many sample as we can, we were working with as many uh, professional organizations as we can, because that's the most effective way of getting and getting the survey in hands of the right people that we're trying to reach. So in a way the the waiting part of it is kind of, so we're, we're getting the word out where we're asking, you know, the, everybody to complete the survey. And then once we get the responses back, then we'll be um, we, we're looking at the um, the implant and, and the other uh, census data to kind of uh, match like how representative of different sectors we were able to uh, uh, hear back from, and and that's where the, the weights will be determined to see how representative of different states, uh, different sectors, uh, we were able to hear back from, and and depending on you know if if there were certain sectors that we really had a low response rate, we will try to um, follow up with them to make sure that we have we're comfortable with the representation of of across all states um all say all sorry all sectors uh in in different types of um commodity groups that are involved that sounds great anybody else want to add anything to that nope great okay uh and our last question and we may end a few minutes early won't that be lovely looking at all of us being on zoom meetings all the time we'll take a few extra minutes <laughs> is um are we developing any program to minimize the waste of food and to direct products to food banks and homeless? I don't, I can answer that a little bit. I, I don't know that we're developing programs for it. Um, and I'm not sure that we're measuring it. That wasn't exactly the, the objective of this project, but if anybody else has something they want to contribute to that, I welcome it. So I don't, I don't think that we are directly measuring it and we're certainly not creating a new program, but we are working with uh, industry groups and um, state agencies, at least here in Florida, for sure. And I believe in the other areas uh, through the advisory board um, and with tools that they have already developed or are in the process of developing to try to answer some of those questions. So it might be that the information coming from our survey will continue to inform uh, the decision making that's going on in those other programs. I know here in Florida, um, there was one developed through the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, as well as um, some efforts of other local groups and the Florida Farm Bureau Foundation. So I, I we, we do have um, food banks represented in our advisory board and, and hopefully the information that we're producing will provide information and insights, even if we are not um, producing a particular program to that. Our, our survey does ask uh, about donations, whether in retail or farm or anywhere. Mm -hmm. So when we're asking about sales channels, we're at least gonna be able to capture in which moments, in which places and sectors, was there maybe an uptick in donations, whether it's directly to food banks or to other NGOs and, and so forth and so on. And I think across all of our regions, certainly here in California also, we're working very closely with uh, partners who are in touch with food banks and NGOs that are focused on reducing food wastage all the way from farm actually to into the, into the cities. And this is certainly something that we can follow up and dig in a bit more when we do the focus groups. The focus groups aren't only gonna be with industry folks, we're also, planning to have different focus groups where we can bring in policymakers or we can bring in people who are working on these questions of you know, structure, you know, programs that are in place to you know, support people who are, who are houseless, people who are facing economic difficulty and how they can link up with various different other programs. 
And that goes beyond too. School canteens, other institutional canteens, you know, there's there's a whole world out there of the food system that will be useful for us to try and survey, even if the fit isn't quite perfect for the survey, it will still be helpful to get that data. And we hope that our data is going to inform really good conversations um, about that question when we go into the focus groups. And Cheryl, if you don't mind, Gustavo's answer reminded me of the other question related to local, state, and federal regulations. Um, so one good thing is that most of the food supply chain was considered essential and allowed to keep operating in some capacity, um, even through several shutdowns. But we do ask specifically if there were uh, local, state, or federal regulations that impacted a decision to close or were impacting things like sales revenues within the survey. And one interesting thing that we found out in following up with an interview effort after um, our initial survey was that sometimes these regulations were indirectly impacting businesses as opposed to, you know, regulating that they had to shut down. It was they happened to be low, if it was a farmer's market, the difference in whether they were allowed to be open on a private um, piece of land versus a public piece of land that, uh, that mattered in that decision. So I, I think that um, a lot of what we will find through the survey, it, there will be some questions specific to that, but we might even find through the open responses or through the follow-up interview and focus group efforts that a lot of these regulations were indirectly impacting the food system, even though it was deemed essential and um, not included in a lot of the shutdowns or, or at least not completely shut down. Well, thank you for, for that added detail, Krista, and thank all of you uh, on the team for presenting this information. and. We are looking forward to, to sharing even more of our data at our next webinar in June. So is there anything else you'd like to add, Hikaru? All right, with that, thank you for joining us and we'll see you again soon.